Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald at the Historical Society of Quincy and Adams County, where we have a real treat today. The man who has the Motorola radio collection is here, and he set up a temporary exhibit just for this program. Now, Motorola employed more than 4,000 people between 1950 and 1976 and created many one-of-a-kinds. This is a look at some of the creations. Well, Olin Schuler, we're looking at just a small sample of all the radios that were produced in Quincy by the Motorola Corporation. At one time, the biggest employer in Quincy. That is correct. More than yes. 4,000 people That's worked right. at Motorola. Yes. What a blow it must have been to this community when they decided to close up that plant. It really was. It was a very serious situation. Yeah. And it, uh, we, we all put our best efforts into carrying our lives forward and really did pretty well afterwards. <laughs> We're going to talk to not only you, but some other people who worked at the Motorola right. plant years ago. They closed it up back in the 70s, so it's been a yes. long time since. But you also not only have the distinction of having worked there and having been, a, I think, a production supervisor, is that right? Uh, manager of the production engineering department. Oh, the production engineering department. Yes. Okay, so so you actually did a lot of design work on some no, of these radios. No, we, we, we took care of the design and made sure that the design lived up to its requirements after the manufacturing processes were okay, complete. Okay, okay. So if it didn't work right, it was your problem. That, that's, <laughs> that's how that worked, yes. Okay. And we did just fine with that. You have also collected an enormous number of these radios, and we're going to get a look at your personal collection of Motorola radios. And Great. it's really neat because not only do you collect them, but I mean, you had a lot of responsibility for making sure that they worked. So this is, you're the right guy. Yes, these, these, were, these were all my friends. Okay. These, are, these are things Let's start with the up. earliest one, okay? Fine. And I think, I think we're, looking, we're looking here, aren't we? Yes, that was from, from, uh, from 1949, 1950, when there was a plant at, at uh, Third and Broadway, and these first few radios that, that we're seeing here all came from the third and Broadway plant. Mm -hmm. And that would have been in the, in the uh, what, around 1950? 1950, uh, 1950, 1951, mm -hmm. 52, 53. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now you, you singled this one out for a reason. Yes, Let's... that is the, uh, that is the first Motorola home radio to have a printed circuit board where radios up to, up to that point had been wired, uh, uh, did, uh, did hand wiring, uh, and uh, the printed circuit boards were much more compact, much more precise in their layout and, and performance, and that, uh, that practice then moved through the industry in the next seven to ten years. That was the wave of the future. At the that time. absolutely was, okay. yes. But Motorola continued to make them the old-fashioned. That's way, right. Uh, the, the, uh, the first few sets that you see here were all hand-wired chassis mm -hmm. and uh, we saw the, the coming of the very basic looking clock radios and then the, the, the more highly styled clock radios mm -hmm. from 1953, This is a beautiful piece. Is this 53? About 1953? Yes, about 1953. That's, 1953. that's really a neat looking uh, uh, outfit, isn't it? Isn't that nifty? Okay, and now they're starting to get really colorful. Too, Styling right? and color w were a major selling point for, the, for everyone's radios in those days. You can see the, uh, the styles and the colors and the shapes and the unusual mm -hmm. applications, the, the the one with the large clock back there. Which one are we a, looking at? Uh, was oh, a, this, this one here? That was a was known as the pin-up wall clock radio. <laughs> and was quite a, a handy item for mm -hmm. the for kitchens. Now at the time, at the time, not not in the 50s, but later on in in the 60s, Motorola was actually 
the largest maker of radios in the world, is that right? No, that is not right. Uh, they were number three in the market in the, in the 1950s. Uh -huh. the, as, the, as the clock radios came along, here is one of some particular interest. Okay. In the back, there was, a, was an outlet for a coffee maker. <laughs> wow. it, would brew, it would turn on your coffee maker in the morning. If you chose to wake up to recorded music, you could plug your record player in there and have it come on when no you kidding. wake up. Well, how neat is that? In the, on the clock face, there was a clock movement that told you the day of the month mm -hmm. and the the day of the week mm -hmm. besides the time and the wake up alarm oh, features. Darn. So that was a f and, and we're still in the 50s here, is that right? 1957, 1958. Oh, uh -huh. Now we're starting to get into those kind of gaudy colors, you know, that you think of when That's you think right. of, this, of the late 50s and the 60s. And this, of course, looks like it has all the advantages that that That's last right. one did. It's just a little like a trimmer, a little trimmer look. Ladies like that one. That one well, is always like referred to as pretty in pink. <laughs> <laughs> now this one looks like it's got a lot going on. That was the first of the AM FM clock radios. Is that right? When FM broadcasting went through a resurgence and a rebirth and growth in the early 60s, everyone got back into the AM FM radio business mm -hmm. and AM FM clock radios became more and more common. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were, we were there with, uh, with clock radios and table radios. And, as, and this is called a table radio here? Yes. Okay. And here's, uh, again, more, more pink. The ladies like that pink, don't they? Now, you mentioned AM. I guess one of the things that had to, one of the reasons FM had a resurgence was because of car radios. That is correct. Motorola also made car radios, and we're going to see those as well later on in the program. They made millions, millions of car radios were, were produced in the plant in Quincy. Mm -hmm. We built original equipment radios for every automobile banker in the U.S. Wow. except General Motors. Mm -hmm. Okay, Olin, I think we're in the 60s here, aren't we? That is correct. Still, everything's made with plastic. That's right. Uh, even even the wood is plastic. No, that is, is that genuine wood? wood. Is it really? Yes, well, every once is, in a while, is, they would leave is, the plastic. Yes, mold, that huh? uh, for the top of the line models, top of the of the trim, mm -hmm. uh, we were getting back into wood cabinets mm -hmm. and uh, uh, looking for good styling and and good performance. Uh, and uh, we were then beginning to feel a little price pressure from radios built in the Far East. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it uh, wasn't very long before home radios, table model radios, became pretty much of a, of a commodity uh, driven by price rather than by styling mm -hmm. and features. So Motorola responded by building cheaper radios, didn't they? Well, let's not say cheaper, cheaper. less well, expensive less expensive, radios. yeah, that's, still, that, good. That still good. That is correct, yes. Yeah. But this is an example of one of the lesser... That's right. What would this have cost in this? Probably $29 to $34 uh -huh. in, so, uh, well, in, that, that, in uh, 1960 money. That's, yeah, that's real money. Yes, I mean, that's... Yes. that's the, okay, now, here's another thing that came out from the, from the Far East. They, they, they required American radio makers to start making portable models, didn't they? Because weren't they making those in Japan? The, the radio industry moved from the U.S. to Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the real price leaders in the uh, late 1950s were made in Japan. Mm -hmm. Motorola cashed in on this on two models that will look uh, that, that we will see later. Mm -hmm. They were the, the first ones. Where huh? we bought all of the parts for the radios from Japan, brought them to Quincy, and Adams County and Quincy Housewives put the <laughs> transistor portables together, and we, we had a pair of very well-performing, very hot-selling hot, hot selling 
Japanese transistor radios made in Quincy, Illinois, selling for the price leader price of twenty nine ninety five. And and you'll show those to us. Oh yes. Right? Okay. It, 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 these are a couple examples here of some of the early uh, some of the early portable. Yes, ones. and uh, this is this is a cutie here. That's a that's it a is. nice size one. But there's my favorite mark because that is probably the nicest, best performing transistor portable that we built here. That mm -hmm. was. That was nicely styled with a nice genuine leather case, very good sensitivity and very good performance. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, and it's just it's about the right size. It is. Know? It yeah, is not too heavy. Um, then, of course, you, you you were into the sophisticated electronics as well. And the, this is a tuner amplifier, and uh, you even went as far, didn't you, at the Motorola plant as building this? What'd you call it? Quadraphonic. Quadra quadraphonic sound. Four-channel stereo. Uh -huh. And that would take an eight trap. Eight, eight track tape. That the the uh, the quadraphonic sound was recorded on an eight track tape and then played through mm -hmm. the player. We were in the component stereo business for two model years, but once again, price pressure from Japan took us out of that, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, quadraphonic model uh, didn't didn't sell as well as was hoped because the source of program material for it didn't develop like we thought that it would. Mm -hmm. Rose Hope Griever, you worked at Motorola for many years. How many? 26 years. 26 years. Well, Start of February of 1950 and uh, May of 76 is when the plant closed in Quincy. Mm -hmm. And I went to Chicago to work w up at uh, a Carroll Stream uh, to get all the lines uh, that was in Quincy moved up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then did you stay up there for any period no, of time? No, no. Come I would come home up. every week. I'd go up on a Monday and mm -hmm. come back on a Friday. I'll bet mm -hmm. it was pretty sad, wasn't it, to take the position to go up there and open a new plant and knowing that this one was closing down and all it, those thousands of people were not going to be working. It was sad, but uh, there was a lot of good people up there too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had excellent people here. It's just a sad thing, too, that we had to give it up because mm -hmm. yep. uh, uh, we loved the work and the people were so good. What did you do at the plant? I, when I started, I wired and soldered on the line, production line, mm -hmm. as you can see on the pictures, some mm -hmm. here. And then later on, you became a supervisor, I guess. Yes, I was a key operator. And a key operator consists of uh, taking the place of someone that was absent or any, th any job on that line I could sit and okay. do Okay, you it. knew how to do them all. Yeah, yeah, you had to, yeah. Let's take a look at some of these. Now, you, you were mentioning, let's take a look at the assembly line up here. This is a typical line that you supervise, isn't it? Right. What are they doing? And they're wiring and soldering and in certain parts wiring up stuff. And it would start from this girl here and go on down, and when it ended, it was tested and put into a box to be shipped. Mm -hmm. But she would start the first thing. There was uh, a timer that would tell her to put one on that line, and uh, it would just keep moving down to the next girl and the next mm -hmm. girl. So if she wasn't finished yet, it's tough luck. <laughs> it's yeah, moving anyway, it, right? <laughs> this one didn't move. This was a wooden oh, track. Okay, this is one she, she would uh, pass it along. Right? Yes. Okay. But in later years, uh, it would move. Yes. Yeah. We had a conveyor belt, and so many seconds you had a wire solder, whatever your job yeah. consists of, and it would move. Sometimes you was leaning clear over doing your work, but you got it done. That would drive me yeah. crazy. <laughs> that would drive me nuts. But I just loved the work. It was Did you? it was really yeah. a good place to work. Yeah. They, this is uh, this is called this was called a an place, innovation at the time. Yeah, this was a printed circuit, which is a lazy Susan, and these girls would insert parts into a panel, and uh, they didn't even have to look up; they could just insert them, and mm -hmm. then this would move automatically. Mm -hmm. If you was half done, then. Uh, someone would have to stand there and try to put those parts in. Mm -hmm. Or when it would go all the way through, it was soldered. The complete job was done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And and it was probably kind of exciting, wasn't it, working in a plant where they were where they were making the most modern things in the world? Oh yes, oh yes. I just was fascinated. Couldn't wait till I got there the next really? day to do my work. Isn't that nice? <laughs> oh yes, I just loved my work at Motorola. Yes, I really did. So, and just like all of these radios I've worked on and we've done them, and uh, everything had to be perfect. They wouldn't let anything go. Mm -hmm. Even a little knob, if there was just a little flaw in it, uh, it was thrown aside. They inspected carefully. Oh, yes. We had inspectors, and uh, so everything had to be perfect yeah. on it. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're more than welcome. Okay, Olin, now a little Motorola history here. We're looking at Motorola's first facility in Quincy. It used to be a roller rink, I guess. Huh? That's right. It was a skating rink out in Baldwin Park, mm -hmm. south of the senior high school. Uh -huh. And then the picture below it shows that in 1948, uh, they moved to another existing plant. I guess they outgrew the first one. Yes, there, uh, there was, a, was a plan to build automobile radios here, and automobile radios moved into 17th and Locust, mm -hmm. and that that building looks very much the same today. Mm -hmm. And then the, the Broadway plant below it, did they, did they then uh, join, join up these uh, various interests and put them all in there? Is that how that worked? In 1950, the Baldwin Park plant was closed. The Locust Street plant remained dedicated to automobile radios, and the mm -hmm. balance of the, of the activity here was then done at 3rd and Broadway. And you, you worked in this plant, didn't you, Olin? Yes, that was where I was hired and worked my first day. Mm -hmm. and in fact, you were interviewed, and in, were you interviewed earlier? I was interviewed out All at, the way up uh, at the old plant, yeah. huh? <laughs> And then I also worked for a time there. Uh-huh, and, and then, of course, people really recognize this, the ultra-modern one on 30th Street. That was just a massive plant that, that they was, built. That was built in Started in 1955, finished in mm -hmm. 1956. Yeah. And, in. and after an expansion to that plant, then, as we mentioned, 4, 000, more than 4,000 people worked there. 4,000 people with a, with a square footage of over 800,000 square feet. Wow, wow. Now, some individuals here, some principals in this whole yes. Motorola game. Picture up here shows a fellow named Bill Lear. That's and right. People may recognize that name because he went on to build jet aircraft, didn't he? In, yes, and in his youth, he passed through Quincy and uh, was a knowledgeable radio engineer at that time. Went into business here briefly as, as the Quincy Radio Labs. And uh, as he was here, he hired a, a technician who was a high school student named Elmer Wavering. Mm -hmm. Wavering worked for Lear for a while. Lear moved on to Chicago and uh, Elmer stayed in, in Quincy working in some ventures and eventually in his own service shop, Waverite Radio Service. Would you point that out 12. for us, sir? Right There's there. Waverite, huh? Okay. And now what's his connection to Motorola? All right. When Bill Lear got to Chicago, he met the founders of Motorola who were who were eagerly working on the automobile radio project and needed some technical help, Bill Lear said, I know just a guy. There's this fellow named uh, Elmer Wavering at Quincy. Mm -hmm. He'd be a good man to bring in. Uh, they did, and Elmer Wavering was one of the, he's credited with being the inventor or the final developer of the, of the first practical mass-produced automobile radio. Huh. And, and in fact, this plant probably wouldn't have been located in Quincy if it hadn't been for Elmer. Obama. That is true. Yeah. Now, you mentioned car radios. I want to take a little walk over here. Fine. Because do, you just happen to have a wonderful exhibit for us over here of car radios that were built here car. by Motorola in Quincy. Yes. Let's start with the oldest. The oldest was one from 1953. This was a carryover of the original Motorola design concept that was quite widely used through the 30s and 40s, where the main unit and the loudspeaker was placed well up under the dashboard. Mm -hmm. In those days, there was room for mm -hmm. that. And then some mechanical control cables came down to a control head 
that was either in the dashboard or on the steering mm -hmm. wheel. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks it looks very familiar. It hasn't yeah. changed very much That's for AM right. radio. And yeah. this is this is another old one. This this is the speaker attached to this the, the control. Uh, head. This is this is the is a is a control head that was designed with the intent of that going into a late 1940s line of Chevrolet automobiles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This particular unit with, uh, with no loudspeaker visible uh, was made to drive a, an outside loudspeaker that would be mounted in the dashboard. I remember pushing buttons to get my station. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that something? What, what year is this circa what? That would be from the, from the early 1970s, about 1970. 73, 74, mm -hmm. that was an, the official electrical sample for a radio that we made for installation in Ford trucks. Mm -hmm. And what about the one behind it, the one that you've got the, the uh, page? That right is here. the first automo the first FM broadcast automobile radio that was, that was made in, uh, in, mass, in mass production quantities by a uh, by a a uh, national builder. Well, Olin, four million television sets made in Quincy, Illinois. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes, that's enough to populate pretty much the whole country. <laughs> well, this was this was done over a roughly ten-year period, mm -hmm. starting in 1966 and ending in the summer of 1975. Mm -hmm. That was the, the activity that occupied the uh, final expansion of the, uh, of the plant as it exists now. Uh, our models that we built were uh, black and white and some color, mm -hmm. table model TVs. Uh, the examples that you have there are an example of the, about the smallest size and then the other one is an example of about the largest size that mm -hmm. we did in a, in a number of various uh, model and trim variations. Mm -hmm. And this would have been in, in the mid to late 60s? Starting in, starting in 1966 through 1975, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a strange animal over here. There, there, aren't, there aren't many of these around, and people may not even be aware that, that this exists, but back in the early 70s, what did you say CBS and Motorola were jointly working on that? A, what we would call a tape player now, or tape recorder. Well, it has the appearance of that. It was known as the electronic video recorder. It, uh, it didn't use tape. It used a, a high-precision optical film as the, as the program media, and a roll of that film mm. was placed on the that, carrier. Yeah. There's a picture and uh, the, with the with the film placed mm -hmm. on the carrier, one would close the door, and the the mechanism would automatically open the reel, find the end of the tape, thread itself, and start. And it was not tape; it was film. Yep. Oh, yes, sorry. it was. It that was would film. Plug into the back of the television. It set. would. It would. It would plug into the back of the TV set just as a VCR does today. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim Sibbing, I, I asked to talk to you because you actually had a hand in developing some of the new products, and some of the new products at Motorola were some of the first in the world ever made. That's right, yes. Wow. <laughs> yes, we developed uh, some of the cutting edge technology of its day, such as the 8-track tape player for automobile use. And it was a long struggle. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, new technology, new engineering. Let's take a look at that right now. We've got one sitting up. Yeah. Does it bring back good memories or bad memories oh, when you look at good memories? <laughs> I mean, memories of working 20 hours a day in mm -hmm. the engineering lab to develop it. It was done uh, for Ford Motor Company. We built all those for Ford, mm -hmm. plus all the aftermarket ones for just about every automobile. Everyone who thinks of 8-track, <clears throat> it came first through Motorola's efforts of development. And um, this, of course, is an under-dash, aftermarket type right. set. But there was a lot of new stuff, 
a lot of very new mechanical features to make that thing work. Let, let's look to the left here because what we see here is a couple of, th these are also firsts, aren't they? That's correct. This, this was a, a real baby. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Well, prior to this radio being built by Motorola, the only shirt pocket portable radio being built was built by Zenith. It was called the Zenith Royal. Mm -hmm. And it was over $100. Mm -hmm. And it was, my gosh, you know, that was something that was brand new. A little bitty radio you could put in your pocket right. on an all transistor radio. Motorola then came in, developed this radio here, which was a six transistor shirt mm -hmm. pocket radio that sold for $29.95, wow. which was an unheard of low price for a shirt pocket portable. Yeah. Remember, this is something brand new. This was the first little radio you could put in your pocket that anybody could afford. And you ran the line. <clears throat> this thing sold, day, this thing, we you. could not build enough of them. We ran three <laughs> shifts a day, 24 hours a day, cranking these out. Okay, Olin, earlier in the program, we promised we'd get to see the first radios built in Quincy. Yes. And here we are. That's right. <laughs> show, show us what we have here. This was the first model that was built here in Quincy in the plant at Baldwin Park on that production line, on that very production line by those people in the spring of 1948. There was another model in the work lineup is this nice green portable that also ran and uh, variations on that model ran on for the next three to four years mm -hmm both at Baldwin Park and later at 3rd and Broadway. Wow, now that's a piece of history for you right there. Thanks, Olin. My pleasure. Okay. Now this and another part of a larger exhibit can be viewed here at the Parsonage when they reopen in March. Now Olin, his personal collection, he put set that up in the John Wood Mansion gift shop for us just for you in this program. So thank you to Olin Shuler for doing that. With another Illinois story in Quincy, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.